Welcome to Zion Mountain Christian Center in Exile. Another opportunity to praise and worship together and to gather around the, the meat of God's Word. As we begin to prepare for worship, I would invite you to listen with me to the words of my dear friend, Pastor Charles Twist. Just listening today. My child, my child, come away with me. Give me a moment of the time that you have claimed for yourself and allow me to breathe into you. The glory of this day. I know you have already begun your planning, anticipating the needs that are going to arise. But what if you allow me to arise instead? What is impossible for me? And did not my son instruct you to ask me anything in his name and I would do it? Have you forgotten that I have asked you for nothing except that you believe? It is written to him who believes nothing is impossible. Today is a good day to remember what you believe and in whom you believe. I gave you a list of instructions so that you would be forever cared for. I did not create a list of rules and demands. Have you forgotten that I gave you a free will? The ability to choose my way or the way of our adversary. And still, I remain true to you. Your adversary tells you that my way is too difficult and impossible to live. But I say, with me, nothing is impossible. I say, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. This is a new day. All things have become new. Let's walk in the freshness of this day. Let me love you today. I only desire more of you, not more of the things that you can do. My only desire is to have more of you. Let it be today. Blessings today as his words become life in you and all of your house. As the seed of salvation buds and yields its seed and the sower will have more seed and more bread to eat and more to give. May health rule in your house through the spirit of peace and wisdom. And that comes as we choose to enter into worship of the Lord our God, as we choose to set aside the worries of today and worship with God. Will you join us now as we enter in to the worship of the one who is truly worthy of all our worship and all of our praise. Let's enter in to praise and worship of the God Most High.
God that loved me enough to die for me. <laughs> ah, but even more than that, you're the God that loved me enough to conquer death for me. You send me your spirit to dwell within, to testify of who you are in my life. You're the one that heals. You're the one that's ever present Join me now for a few minutes 
in the Word of God. Last time we were together, we were talking about the hope that we have, what biblical hope is, and our opportunity to, to live and to walk in, in this present day in biblical hope. And we said that the foundation of that hope is based on the priesthood of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, who was a priest after the order of Melchizedek. I'd like to look a little bit further into that this morning. If you turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. Now at the last part of chapter 6 of Hebrews that uh, we're told that, that God the Father expressed his, the abundance of promise that he gives to us by two things. Two things that cannot change and those are his oath and his covenant. And that he wound up the, the sixth chapter by saying this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, that our mind, our will, and emotions, that's what makes up our soul, is anchored by hope. And this hope that we have is both sure and steadfast. And the hope that we have actually enters into the presence of God behind the veil. You recall that Jesus, when he was crucified, when his blood hit the ground, it shook and it opened up. And at that very time, in the temple, in the, the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was torn from top bottom at the same time that the blood of Jesus, my Savior and your Savior, hit the ground. And that opened up the presence of God. The holy presence of God was opened up to you and I when he gave his life for us. And our hope is based on that sure and steadfast presence which enters that entering of this presence that's behind the veil and at that place is where the forerunner has entered for us even Jesus having becoming high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek so let's look at this priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. So this Melchizedek is first of all king of righteousness, king of right standing, and also king of peace. Verse 3 says he was without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of all the spoils. The reference here is back to Genesis chapter 14. Turn with me, hold, hold a place there in Hebrews. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis 
Genesis chapter 14. Now this is the story of uh, Lot, Abram's son, has been captured and brought into captivity. And Abram and a group of kings goes out to fight the battle of kings to, to win Lot's release again. And um, after, after he won the battle, he brought back all the spoils and divided it again uh, amongst the, the kings that had joined with him in battle to free, to free his brother Lot. And picking up in verse 18, he says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, which means king of peace, brought out bread and wine, for he was the priest of the God Most High, the God of strength, the God of all might is what that means, the God Most High. And he blessed him. So Melchizedek blessed Abram. Now it's Abram here. This is before God got cut covenant with him. That happens actually in the next chapter, chapter 15 of Genesis. He blessed him and he said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven, and earth, the owner of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemy into your hand. Melchizedek appears to Abram, this is before he cut covenant with God and became Abraham, the father of many nations. Before he was in covenant relationship with God, Melchizedek appears to him. Now, I believe with all my heart that Melchizedek is the manifestation of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus, who was before the foundation of the world, who was instrumental in the foundation of the world, who was present in the garden with the Father, with Adam and Eve, who is present here meeting, meeting Abram, whom Abram brings tithe to, tribute to, brings a portion, the first portion, of the spoils that he had taken, who blesses Abraham, and then shortly thereafter God the Father cuts covenant with Abram and changes his name to Abraham, father of many nations, and establishes the covenant with the people of Israel with the God Most High. So Melchizedek here is operating as a priest before the covenant of Abraham. So now let's go back with that understanding. Let's go back to the book of Hebrews. And the writer of the book of Hebrews is, is talking about the, the, the uh, Levitical priesthood, the priesthood that was established as a part of the covenant that God created with Abraham, cut with Abraham, it says, um, verse 4 of chapter 7 of the book of Hebrews, says, Now consider how great this man was, to whom even the patriarch Abram, Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi, who received the priesthood, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people, according to the law, that is, from their brethren, though they have come from the loins of Abraham. So part of the Abrahamic covenant, part of the, the law that was passed down, was that the, the priest, after uh, Aaron, 
would, would receive tithes of all the, their brothers in Israel. Skipping now verse 8 says, Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them, of whom it is written, it is witnessed that he lives. Even Levi, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak. Levi was in the loins of Abraham when Abraham gave tithe to Melchizedek. So in, in, in the terms of lineage, in the terms of his uh, patriarchy, of those who went before him, Levi, in the loins of Abraham, was giving tithe to Melchizedek. He was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Therefore, and here's what we need to understand, verse 11, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under that people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should arise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? You see, there has to be a different priesthood, different from the priesthood of the order of Aaron that was created under the law. For the priesthood created under the law served the law. He of whom these things are spoken, verse 13, belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning the priesthood. Judah had nothing to do with the priesthood of the Old Covenant, of the First Covenant. But Jesus, who was risen and out of the order of Melchizedek, who was before the foundation of the world, was not of the tribe of Levi that was designated by the law to be the priest to receive the tithe. He was at the tribe of Judah. <laughs> Judah means praise. He was the tribe of praise. And yet, it is far more evident that if in the likeness of Melchizedek there arises another priest who has come not according to the law of a fleshly commandment, but according to the power of an endless life. There's the difference. See, Jesus is not a priest designated so by a commandment. Jesus is the priest designated soul by eternal life. A power according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, you are priests forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That's from Psalm 110 and verse 4, but that's only a portion of Psalm 110, verse 4. Let's read a little bit further here in Hebrews chapter 7. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there's a bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And inasmuch as he was not made a priest without oath. Here's the difference. Jesus was not made a priest without oath. The sons of Aaron were. The Levitical priest became priest by the right of ancestry. There was no oath of God instituting the priest as they came in to the priesthood. They have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath, by him who said to him, and here's Psalm 110 verse 4 in its entirety, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. The Lord, Yah, Yahweh, 
the ever-existent eternal God, has said and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This priesthood of Jesus is from time immoral, immortal beginning to time immortal past the end of what we could ever conceive. His priesthood is eternal in both directions. It has no beginning. It has no end. It is not subject to the law. It is before the law. Just as Melchizedek blessed Abram before the covenant of, between Abraham and God was cut, even so, Jesus now, <laughs> after the law has been fulfilled by Jesus and himself, is still a covenant, is still a priest unto us. The priest of covenant, not according to the covenant of the law, but according to the covenant, the order of Melchizedek. There is a better hope through which we draw near to God. By so much more, verse 22, Jesus has become a surety of a stronger covenant. covenant. <laughs> By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant, the King James says, literally a stronger covenant, stronger than the first covenant. God cut with Abraham. It's the covenant that Jesus Christ is the surety, the earnest money, the down payment of. You see, verse 23 says, there are many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. When the priest died, another of his heirs took his place to become the priest because moral priests come to an end of their life. And what the people had, had uh, the relationship that the people had with the priest, with the priests, and the relationship that the priest had with the high priest had to be renewed every time there was another generation because that priest passed away. But Jesus does not pass away. He is not prevented by death from continuing in the priesthood. Verse 24 says, But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Un changeable priesthood. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. We don't have to be concerned with how to appease the way the current priest interprets the Word of God. We have the living God, the earnest Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, the Spirit of the priest who is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and the Spirit dwells within each one of us who accepted Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, who have chosen to walk according to his word. He continues forever. He has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost, to the full end. 
He's able to stick with you until his salvation, his likeness is completed in you. He's able to stick with me until his likeness is completed within me because he lives forever. He's able to save us to the full end, to the uttermost, who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for us. He always lives to make intercession for us. Jesus sits with God the Father. And he says, Dad, let me tell you about our son, about my brother, about my sister, about your son, about your daughter. And we're not here to discuss what they have been able to do to achieve covenant relationships with you. All that falling away has been paid for by my blood, Dad. You remember that. We're here to discuss how my blood and their acceptance of my blood has made them righteous in your sight, has given them access to the most holy place. We have the opportunity to come into this place that God designed to have fellowship with you and I. Verse 26 says, such a high priest was fitting for us. It fills the bill, it meets the need. For he is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. He does not need daily as those priests who offer sacrifices, first for his own sin, and then for the people's. For this he did once, for all, when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law, appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. The way God originally designed it, Adam and Eve were to have fellowship with him. We read in the beginning of Genesis that God walked with them in the cool of the day. But then they chose something different than God desired. And they chose because of Adam's choice. A separation was created. And the same priest that was in the beginning, that was walking with Adam and Eve in the garden with God the Father. The same priest appeared to Abram. And offered him bread and wine. The same priest was with God the Father when God the Father cut covenant with Abraham. Abram causing him to become Abraham in, in chapter 15 of Genesis. The same priest who is forever appeared unto prophets and unto kings from time to time under the old covenant. This same priest who thought it nothing to consider himself equal with God the Father because he was equal with God the Father, nevertheless 
set that aside and became a man and dwelt among us and gave himself for us on the cross of Calvary. And when he had gone into hell itself and taken captivity captive and taken back the authority that was stolen from Adam and Eve and gave it back to man. Then he went and sat at the right hand of the Father. And he sent his spirit back to us. Read about it in John chapter 14, John chapter 15. He sent his spirit, who is exactly like him, back to dwell within us. To cause his presence to be available to us 24-7, 365. And we have the ability to enter into his presence the one who has the ear of the Father at all times. The one who makes intercession for us. The one who gave us his hope as a foundation, as a surety, as an anchor for what I think, for what I feel. And that's why, regardless of what goes on around us, regardless of what the ones in authority say, because the ones in authority are not going to be in authority forever. There'll be another election. There'll be someone else in authority. And they will change. The way we interact with them is going to change. They'll uh, issue executive orders to get rid of the executive orders that the last one issued and, and, and things will change. Things are, the, 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 the only thing that remains the same is things will not remain the same. But you see, my hope, my security is not based on that. Because you and I have relationships. with the high priest who is a high priest forever and the way we have relationship with that with him is that he sent his spirit back to dwell within you and with I within I me uh, yeah I got a C minus in English but you know what I'm saying. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. <laughs> but you see, I don't have to hope someday that I may obtain righteousness. Because the Apostle Paul reminds us that he who knew no sin, that's Jesus, became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Yeah, might, there, that, that's conditional. <laughs> the condition is that we remain in him. You take your spirit with you wherever you go. And the 
purpose of his spirit, according to the book of John, is that the spirit of God within will bring to mind what Jesus says. Remember the, the bracelets that used to came out a long time ago, WWJD, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Yes, I need to study to show myself approved. I need to understand. I need to read what the Word of God says. But not just read it and try to figure it out. Because Jesus gave me his spirit. The same spirit who inspired the people to write these words is here within each one of us to give inspiration to our ears, to give inspiration to understanding, to read these words. And he's here. Whatever goes on around me, whatever happens in front of me, whatever I face, he is here to bring to my understanding what Jesus is saying in this instance, in this case. I don't have to try to figure out what would Jesus do? We don't have to do that. We do have to choose to consume his word, to put it in the memory banks, and to maintain a constant fellowship with our Savior, with our Lord, so that Holy Spirit can bring back to our memory what Jesus has said to us. And that is what's going to sustain our hope, regardless of what happens in the United States, regardless of what happens in California, regardless of what happens in the, the county or the city that you live in. See, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus his righteousness. Father, I thank you that you've given us your hope. You've given us a sure hope, a sure foundation. It's sure because it's not based on our abilities. It's based on who my Savior is, who he is, and what he does. And that's made available to us as we choose to worship in spirit, as we choose to worship in truth, as we choose to listen to the still small voice of the Spirit of God within us, causing your word to come alive, causing your word to be meat and power and authority in our day-to-day -day life. We honor you, pray. We offer you praise. We offer you glory and honor this to you. In Jesus' mighty name.